Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod episode seven. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We're the Cube Pod. Uh, first 10 episodes getting out of the gate, getting cadence down. Dave, good to see you. Hey, John. Seventh episode of the Cube Pod where we're trying to get you know, the most important stories that we're tracking all week long, um, digging into who we're talking to, sharing it out, what's going on in the world of tech, enterprise tech, and of course, love the rant sections we've been doing. Really been liking how um, we can riff on topics a little bit long form, hour. I think, you know, after 10 episodes, we'll start looking at bringing in Cube guests. Uh, but overall, um, you know, getting our, our wheels on the track, so to speak, and uh, get into it. Well, I love it, John, because you got a beat on the news. You know, I'm always heads down on Fridays doing breaking analysis, and I pop up, and it's just a great way to reconnect. So thanks for making the time. Well, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. This week has been um, a lot of news, a lot of weird stuff happening. Again, it's just an ongoing, you know, cadence of the tale of two worlds we're living in, a world of weirdness. Trump is indicted. Founders getting killed in San Francisco, the hardest funding market in the history of entrepreneurship of Silicon Valley and tech. Um, large funds are not doing well. It's a shift. On the other hand, you got the you know funding abundant if you have AI in your business plan. So we're seeing a major shift. It just feels like some of the things we've been talking about, Dave, where the world is shifting uh, culturally and starting to see some signs of, of, of brightness and then kind of like the purge and shift from old stuff that people are rejecting. And so a lot of stuff to talk about, um, you know, to me, I mean, I think I was most impacted this week um, by the Trump indictment, obviously seeing a president in the courtroom is just was absolutely ridiculous. Um, but really what, what shook me was the um, death of Bob Lee, the creator of the cash app um, CTO of mobile coin. And uh, he was killed in San Francisco. He actually went up, to, he went up went to a car and car drove away. Uh, even today, there's another story breaking this morning around how the former police um, commissioner was beaten up with a pipe, almost killed, because some people were smoking crack in front of his mom's house. She's like in her late 70s. And if the neighbors didn't come out, he'd be dead. So homeless lawlessness just continues in San Francisco. This is what does to me hit home because, you know, you got a founder, tech founder. You know, the Bay Area was Silicon Valley. Then everyone moves to San Francisco and you get the Bay Area in general. But San Francisco for the past decade has been kind of where everyone's been going for startups. And now you can't even walk down the street, Dave. It's and sure. it's just this is a this is a absolute uh, encapsulates the shit show that is San Francisco. Meanwhile, the week earlier, last week, you had the biggest renaissance in San Francisco ever with the you know Woodstock AI conference, thousands and thousands of people. And so it's really just it's a time of change and it's just where, where it, was that john it was like this it was like rancon i'm not familiar with that it's like south southeast of it's it's right like where market. the bay right where the bay bridge is you know where um spear street is as you go as you walk towards um it's on main street main street's a short street between market and the where the bridge corner turns where the bay bridge is there used to be a gordon beer show they used to hang out in the old days but you know it's, a, it's an area that's commercial i um, say it's not particularly bad neighborhood right or it's just uh, i mean no it's it's san francisco it's all safe but here's the problem like i said with the homeless guys getting beaten up on the the the, the son gonna tell us tell the people to get off their his mom's porch in the marina district he almost got beaten to death if the neighbors didn't come out so there's just a level of lawlessness in san francisco right now where it's just bad i mean you see well, all you, in the news you were impacted i mean when was that three years ago Four years I think, ago, I think, I think like six years ago, four, five years ago, I, I was by attacked. Moscone, right? You yeah. got didn't you get maced? I was maced, exactly maced and attacked. And if I wasn't an East Coast ninja defending myself, I probably could have been assault, uh, injured seriously. But it was, you know, I defended myself and had to fight back. And tell that and, story. What, I mean, what I mean, I haven't heard it in a while, but it kinda, was it's kind of it's kind of weird. I was walking back from the Marriott to go to get my car at Third Avenue parking garage and. And as I was getting my parking ticket turned around, pressed a paying and getting the receipt ticket back and person's in my face with mace and, uh, you know, going for the wallet, trying to, you know, attack me and, and get out of there. I didn't even see a weapon or anything. I was just like that maced. I was wearing my glasses at the time. So I felt like I, I wore my you know, safety goggles in science class because it's probably saved me from being deep, uh, knocked down. But it was tough. It was like a really, really brutal mace is. It was stinging. I couldn't even find my glasses. I could barely see for like 30 minutes. 
Um, the person did run away, didn't get the wallet, and I defended myself. But it's out in the open. Car break-ins is well known in San Francisco. Um, homeless camp, meth, drug use. Areas that used to be safe to walk around Moscone are, are now encampments for homeless shelters. It's a real big problem. Didn't and, you get smash and grab too? Didn't you? Yeah, did, lost my and did, bag. It's sort, of, many... it sort of Danny Ryan uh, yeah. when he was yeah. at the CTO of Crowd Chat, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just parked, uh, ran into, games. parked um, in front of a bar to run in and meet someone, literally for 10 minutes, came out, bag's gone, no laptop. And uh, next thing you know, it's at the flea market in open. So, you know, it, it's, it, I mean, smash and grab, okay, break ins, that's theft. But like, you go to New York, that used to be like that in there. But this is like really bad. Like, the, the homeless and the crime wave, the drug use, the uh, the lawlessness, it's it's a political issue. And and this founder who was killed, you know, is literally d dialing up, walking around and bleeding out on the streets. It's just happened two 30 in the morning. No one knows kind of what happened. No suspect. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it hits home when it's one of your own, but you know, like, Hey, you go move to San Francisco, pursue the entrepreneurial dream. And it's not safe. This is going to have an impact uh, on entrepreneurship. So, um, if the city's got to get their act together. So well, and yeah, you know, Moscone, you know, that area around Moscone is not great. I mean, and, and it's beautiful new facility, but it's so damn expensive, you know, with RSA coming up, it's the thing sold out. I'm staying at the Pickwick. I think it's 600 bucks a night. Cause that's all I could get. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> I mean, uh, it's well, like, the, I, the I Yenmark... remember VMware somebody told to me the conference. They they, they said, "Well, oh, yeah." Well, somebody who I I'll won't name told me, you know, she knows, you know, expenses. She said it's three to four times more expensive for her to run a conference in Moscone than it is in Vegas. Three to four x. Yeah, yeah, and you know that's real incentive when people getting killed. And there's been stories of you know people flying in for a, a tech conference. You know, and they stray to the Tenderloin area of San Francisco and get mugged or get killed. It's happened before. It's not as uh, they don't probably didn't want to publicize it, but it's just not safe. Right? You remember and, we went to um, Hamilton in the Tenderloin? Do you remember that? I do. And I we do. were walking down the street. I, it was like open, people shooting up, and, you know, <laughs> it's smoking gotten worse. crack. And it's gotten it's, worse, Dave. It's, since then. it's gotten worse since then. So, you know, it's. It's not, it's not safe. It's just it's traveling packs, done. people traveling <laughs> packs. Well, I, I think ultimately San Francisco is a very um, vibrant city. Anyway, I think it's going to come back. Um, you know, it's the Bay area. Everyone loves the comeback and it's just really a political thing right now. I think no one's disagreeing. You ask anyone in San Francisco, anybody, it's unanimous. There probably won't be one person who would agree with the statement that if someone said San Francisco is okay, it's not okay. There's a unanimous revolt happening. Um, it's just not okay. And I think yeah, we'll see what happens. I don't live there. We live in, you know, in the Bay area of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto. So it's like, you know, good down here, but different world, you know, so. you know, Deb and I were out there for, you know, our 25th and we, we went to Napa, but then, you know, we stayed in San Francisco for, I don't know, three days. And I warned her, I was like, you got to watch it. It was fine. It was great. We had no problem. Really didn't encounter, you know, any issues went out at night, walking around during the day. Um, so I'm like, okay, maybe getting better, but then you see a story like this and it's like, crap, it's scary. So, so, so bad. Other news, um, just a lot of stuff going on around Elon Musk and Twitter. I mean, we should have a whole segment of the pot on Elon. He's fodder for, um, uh, just news. So just this week, two things have jumped out at me. One, he basically put NPR's twitter handle as labeled st uh state media which is like russian media it's like state affiliated media which is a complete insult um and what happened was state affiliated media tag is really bad when prior to this tag it said on there that they were an example of what isn't state affiliated media with B along with the bbc so clearly this is a you know one of those things where it's troll i called it uh um, you know, the troll of the century because he's basically trying to get at them some vendetta, but, you know, he, he admitted it was a mistake, but, you know, that's because of the backlash. Um, NPR reported that, but obviously, obviously it was a little ding. This is, well, a, this, this is, this is a culture with Twitter now in this world where you know, people get in power and they just want to rile up the other side. So I just have a problem with that. I think that was mis misuse. I mean, I, I like NPR. I find that they're okay. They're not always fast on the news. Like, 
we're in the trenches, so we see things faster. But they do a good job. They do a good job of reporting. Um, I mean, look, NPR is it's passive liberalism. OK, but it's not state sponsored media. I mean, they do good reporting. Uh, I mean, and it's high quality. I, I, it's just yeah, they're, it's they're ridiculous. They're, they're, they're good. <laughs> so I mean, you like them. It's I'm, I'm New York Times, NPR, you can disagree with them most of the time. But you know, they hire legit media reporters to report as best they can. They do bias. And that's a different conversation. But bias in the media is changing. You're seeing now with. Uh, these outlets like Twitter, people, all kinds of voices are coming in. I think there's going to be a revolution reset on media in terms of this whole historical uh, liberal bias. I, you know, I think that's overplayed. I think, yeah, I, I would see it, but definitely you're going to start to see more calibration. I think there's a huge center centric population that is liberal and not hardcore liberal or left. They're liberal on social, maybe conservative on fiscal. Um, I think that's an underrepresented audience in 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 media. So you know me, John. You know me. I'm down the middle. It's like I, I tell my friends on the left that actually, you know, Fox News when they're not spewing actually has really good reporting. And I tell my friends on the right, you know, New York Times and NPR, it's actually really good reporting. You know, when they're not <laughs> opining. So you got to. That's the only way you can get. I don't know if you remember the show called The McLaughlin Group. I, I, I loved that show. That guy was great, John McLaughlin. And he was like hard, hardcore Republican, but he would have you know people that were, were liberal on the show and they're really smart and they would debate and you'd get both sides. And it's like, remember 60 Minutes used to have you know the point counterpoint? That that's gone. Yeah. You have to like switch channels to get well, in, well the scarcity, the scarcity's gone, right? So you have no the scarcity is not there on media, unlimited media now. And so what's going on with Twitter and, and these areas, and this is general in my philosophy. And I think we look look back, we'll be right on this. Trust matters, right? Mm -hmm. Reputation and trust matter. And the more transparent, the more voices are in the equation, the more data is going to come in. And that's going to level things out. And the Elon thing with the, the, the NPR, it's kind of like a kid's game, you know, get off my lawn kind of thing, you know, making fun of them, a little check mark, kind of making a play troll at them. That's just one side. This news today breaking and you know i have i have about twenty eight thousand subscribers on our Substack, and Substack is uh, is claiming and, and reported um the verge is carrying the story new york times uh the hill vismo axios they're all carrying all the mainstream media uh are carrying it Substack says twitter is unexpectedly restricting access to embedding tweets on authors posts there so because Substack announced a timeline feature similar to twitter so what happens overnight dave it doesn't work on Twitter. Now you and uh, I have you, know? you and you and I have talked about this. Remember yeah. back in the day with Lotus One Two Three and Microsoft yeah. Excel, yeah. The, the philosophy at Microsoft was, "Job's not done till Lotus doesn't run." Uh, and, and then, then okay, and then the, this the, is absolutely the exact same thing. This is a fire across the bow, and then also Twitter shut down the OAuth with Twitter. Flipboard was impacted. The founder of Flipboard, Mike McHugh, former Netscaper former um, entrepreneur and other big startups tell me he was one of his companies. He's running Flipboard. They just shut off authentication with no notice. So if you're a Flipboard user, the aggregate news aggregator, you can't log in. So like, this is like the shit that they're doing. So if they continue to do this and they don't get it right, they're going to lose users. And finally, the biggest troll of the century with Twitter was the Dogecoin logo on Twitter. He swapped out the bird for the dogecoin logo now the bird's back today but it was like a good four three days such an asshat move but, so I mean, that, the dogecoin <laughs> now and dogecoin's up i don't know what the number is it was up to like 10 10 cents so it was up like 30 plus it, percent that one that, day it that, shot that, up that's like insider trading you're using your platform to pump up your own stock and the doge <laughs> is <laughs> just garbage i mean we it's know i mean I, you know i i like crypto but so, i like and some good crypto but the doge is nonsense so and they, this is trust issues. So like, I mean, I kind of like it on one hand. It's very sophomore kind of joke. Uh, NPR, see, I made you state labeled, you know, oh, Dogecoin, clever hack, ha, huh? you know, mean culture. But, it, you know, I, I get that sophomore kind of move. It's kind of funny. You laugh at it, right? It's, it's uh, but it's not, it's not going to have any impact positively, in my opinion. It's only backlash in my, so, so like, I'm kind of like, well, is it really worth it? You know, mm. trust, you lose the trust. You do it. But, so, I mean, if I were a Tesla shareholder, I'd be pissed. Like, get back to, you know, business here. <laughs> you got, you got some serious, you know, issues. You got, 
you know, competition coming in. You got to figure out pricing. You got how many EV, you know, competitors are coming out of China. You know, get focused. Come on, stop with Twitter. I guess, well, they just hired somebody to run it, right? So that's right. That's right. Well, the other big news, obviously, in the in the top line is Trump was arrested on 34 felony counts, um, which was weird. Again, this is we don't want to, I want to spend a lot of time on Trump because it's really not an issue. But, you know, Stormy Daniels that way back when there's some great memes going around. It was I saw some last night because I've been indicted. They made a song out of it. Um, uh, I'm so excited that song. I think I'm so indicted. And then it no, was, no. It, it was good. It was, it was on the, it was all over. I don't time. like it because I just, I, cause you know, I just think it props him up and rallies the bay. I just, you know what? I just, I wish Biden would just pardon him and end it. It's the, the, his, the Biden's base would freak out. All the Trump haters would freak out. Trump wouldn't know what to do. His head would probably explode and then just go away. I, I just, I don't like him being the centerpiece of the news. I told you, I think last week, he's dead to me after January 6th. I, I just, I don't like him being the center of attention, but, and it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, you see front page of the Wall Street Journal, you see, you know, a former president sitting there in the courtroom. I don't know. Just well, you know, the, deal, the, the Republicans had a losing streak on the old midterms. They, they should have crushed it. They blew it. Trump's back in this thing. He's just toxic. It's just got to get out of the way. So, um, but it's just you know former presidents thing in the in in a courtroom uh, indicted. It's just it's uh, it's bizarre. So, um, all right, Dave. Next topic: the continuing AI madness. I know it's April now. March madness was over, um, but AI madness continues. There is a real continuing shift on AI. The the um, pitch book was reporting that the large funds are down. Um, every VC that I've talked to this week, I've talked to like a dozen VCs. They're all saying this is the worst market they've seen. Even the dot-com bubble wasn't this bad from a down market round standpoint. Seed rounds are up a little bit because it's that's the discount goes to the VCs. The market goes down like this. It's a buyer's market for the VCs. It's not a seller's right. market. So A's are, so seeds are doing, doing seed rounds, but those are the new stuff. The future unicorns are going to be born. We'll get to that. A rounds up are dead. You got to be crushing it to get funding. So, on one hand, it's this bad market, the worst that everyone's ever seen. On the other hand, if you're an AI and you have anything with a prototype, you're going to get gushing funding. There's funding everywhere for that. So it's a really interesting time, Dave. And, and the question is, and you know, you know, I'm very big on this big wave. Is this wave going to take over? And is it real? That's, and I just think it's just ironic you have a, a dead market here and a booming market over here really interesting dynamic isn't it and i saw in silicon angle this week like i don't know five or six companies got between you know maybe some small seed rounds three four million but even some more significant rounds and you know and then you think about companies that were raising money during the the tech boom and you know any anybody selling into tech is really hurting you know, their revenues are, or are, are the growth rates are way down. Um, a lot of these companies have, you know, just mm -hmm. maybe tw 12 months or less of cash flow. You know, that's a concern. Um, but I think the, I think the firms that are out, outside of selling to tech are, are doing okay. Some of these startups, because their VCs have, they probably done some layoffs. Um, you know, they've cut their costs. And then there's hunkering down. The question you asked is a good one. Is this, is this real? Yeah. I think it is. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, maybe like a lot of things that's overhyped at the beginning, underhyped at the tail end, but this may be, you know, the start of just a completely new wave of, of automation and, and innovation. That's, that's what I think. Yeah. Um, I, think I don't necessarily I... think everybody's going to win, but I, yeah, I do it's think clear. it's real. I mean, to me, I think this is the biggest inflection point or wave in the history of the computer industry for multiple reasons because the perfect storm is here yeah it's like it's all coming together you got more compute power silicon offload and abstraction layer innovations two killer ways to scale you have software now being open source at, at an all-time high and continue to grow we'll be at kubecon in amsterdam in a, in a week and a half you got uh, machine learning and ai now with large language models computer vision multimodal uh, AI just in the past hundred days have changed everything. And then now infrastructure and tooling's up. So you have not only the applications, 
you got you got uh, you got the tooling, data sources, and actionable foundational models, and then you got um, foundational model ops. Some are calling it prompt ops, like DevOps for prompts, because prompting the, the AI is great. Now we're we're now a couple of weeks into people getting the Chat GPT plugin. We did a little LLM with the cube model that's now up and running a decade's worth of our transcripts and all the cloud guys and all the silicons contributing at the bottom of the stack. So you have infrastructure and now this middle layer, lack of, lack of a better term, is filling in. There's going to be there's going to be at least six to 10 unicorns born from this wave that no one's seen yet. So this is what we're looking at. We are right there. It's happening right in front of us. Unicorns being born. The question is, what is, what's a unicorn going to look like? And I'll tell you this, it ain't going to look like what it was before. I keep flip-flopping on whether or not uh, a open AI is going to get first mover advantage. At first I thought no. And then I thought, well, maybe because they got the early data and then I'm, you know, playing around with, with Bard a little bit and seeing some other things come out. I, I like Bard because it said the cube was number one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like that. Maybe I'm biased. But then you get this plug-in model uh, and I think a new business model is going to emerge out yeah. of this that we really haven't even thought of yet. Uh, um, you know, I mean, I think there are a lot of kind of conventional business models, search, advertising, but, you know, maybe there's an API model that comes out of it. But I, yeah. I, I think well, it's, it's hard it's, to really well, hard to predict. Well, here's here's what I'm seeing right now. So I talked to four entrepreneurs this week. OK, on this one point, and I talked about a dozen last week on this other point around what's a real opportunity. So there's two general schools of thought here in Silicon Valley. One is. It's a wave. It's happening on our beach right now. So we're going to watch these waves. Um, and there's, I won't call it venture hallucinations because that word is being used in chat GPT, but there's opportunity recognition hallucinations. And let me explain what that means. An opportunity recognition hallucination is something that gets pulled forward like the pandemic did with virtual events. You have this pull forward dynamic where things that are out in the forward range of the vision get pulled forward because of the AI advances. But because it's new and it looks like a shiny new toy, people go, wow, that's an opportunity. And they throw money at it. It may or may not have longevity and be durable. So you have this kind of mirage hallucination dynamic going on in around opportunity recognition. Now, this is a trap for VCs because you got to be really smart to know which trend is going to allow beachhead or an ability to sequence to a bigger position. So if you can jump on a low hanging fruit or a mirage or a pull forward opportunity that leverages the, the AI, then you have to have a pivot to the broader durable opportunity. So this is what everyone's talking about in the Valley right now. Everything looks good on paper with chat GPT. You can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not. So the mirage, these hallucination for ventures is coming. Forget the chat GPT being accurate. So this is going to be a capital market dynamic. But right now, uh, if you have AI in your business plan, you get funding. Seed funding so, will be plentiful. So, uh, you know, you I know you've been experimenting with you know, Cube.ai and you know, Cube GPT. And I was on a call this week with Matt Baker from Dell. And I saw him and I was like, hmm, I'm just going to just going to try out the Cube, you know, uh, uh, dot AI. So I said, what does Matt, what does Dell's Matt Baker say about the cloud being a zero sum game? Cause he's always talking about that. He's always talking about that in the cube. And I said, Dell's Matt Baker believes that the cloud should not be thought of as a zero sum game, but as an operating model, he says the cloud operating models are characterized by democratization of technology, access to resources, simplified commerce experiences, instant scalability and agility. These characteristics have only been consistently provided by public cl cloud vendors. However, Dell is capable of bringing the same cloud experience to on-premises environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it was a link to a video. Now he did the same thing for chat GPT, chat GPT, you know, who the hell is Matt Baker? So that was a really interesting experiment, John, where, yeah. and you know, saw Bloomberg, what Bloomberg did, obviously have a bigger corpus of data than we do, but we got a pretty big corpus of data. And so every company on the planet has got to be thinking about this. What proprietary data do we have that we can, you know, use a foundation model to extract data and create new services yeah. for whether it is audiences or customers or whomever? This is exactly what this mirage comes down to. And I was, and I was just thinking about the, you mentioned Google and Bard. Google's going to have a great advantage with their corpus. Uh, I think they're going to hit the beachhead that everyone who has no skills in entrepreneurial or technology will see as an opportunity will be vaporized by Google and Microsoft and Amazon. So you'll have the big guys taking that bigger market. Um, then you're going to see these unique opportunities like you're getting at with like people with proprietary data. 
I think that's the fusion of data that's going to be the killer app here. And that is like what we're talking about with Bloomberg having that uh, d- multiple decades of financial data. We just plugged in a decade of cube data, which I just did a query on the chat, the cubeai.com site that's that's in closed beta. And anyone listening wants to go to the, the cubeai.com. I asked it, what is cloud native networking? This is a topic we were just having in preparation for KubeCon, which is at the Linux Foundation. It came back with cloud native networking is a new operating model, which is different from traditional IT managed, focused on scalability, reliability by construction, which means that the applications are in charge and UX and UI are essentially components. It involves security being baked into everything from the beginning, as well as a closer working relationship with UX designers and developers for shorter feedback cycles. The paradigm is here to stay for the few generations, changing the way software engineering is approached. And the Cisco executive, Dominic Tornow, with a link to the video three years ago. Now, I could get better, but, you know, for an alpha, closed alpha, that's not bad. So every company will have data. The question is, is it in the right source? This is going to be, again, this is why I think that the the Valley is excited about these pull forward opportunities. It's going to give people a chance to get in the game. And will and, Google have that data? That's the other question I have, right? Will Google do what it did to, yeah. you know, old media? Yeah. And, just, and, I, yeah. and I was, I was again, you talk about funding on Silicon Angle. I also, they wrote a story about honey, honeycomb.io, which is a MIT yeah. uh, uh, alumni founded it. Uh, she's amazing. Women-led uh, company. Yeah. And so I talked to her and her big thing was, as AI writes more code, it's going to be more bad code out there. So observability is changing as well. So AI is going to impact all kinds of the software side of the business. And we're going to, again, we're going to be at the cloud native conference in Europe, KubeCon. The hottest themes there are container Kubernetes movement continuing. You're seeing there's still estimated about 70% of enterprises are stuck in the virtual machine world. Only about 30% or so have converted to containers Kubernetes. Massive headroom, and they're all going to move over there. Cube Vert is one. We'll talk to Stu in a minute. Red Hat about that. Developer productivity, security in the in the developer cycle. The AI impact has this human loop aspect. So, in other words, the human's role in the coding is going to be continued. So, you have people not so bullish on the AI and open source and software because, on one hand, you can train it to do stuff, but there's bias in the ethics and the algorithms. So, the the algorithms themselves are going to have all those bias issues. They're going to have all those potentially hallucination problems. They still need to be managed and checked by humans, maybe, but the humans have the right code to check the AI. So observability becomes even more important. And open telemetry is one area that we're going to look at. So you know, that's that. And the other one, finally, is the Broadcom VMware outcome is going to impact the ecosystem. So if VMware stays with Broadcom, is that better for competition or worse? Some are saying that the acquisition helps competition. That's what so, I said. Uh, yeah, that's what I you said, said. Because yeah, because because people are like, well, let's let's take a look at Red Hat, see what they got going. What's Nutanix got over here? It's good for competition. And like I said, uh, I think last week or two weeks ago, it's up to Broadcom to make it more attractive for customers to stay and leave. And I think they're they're going to do that. I, I that whole thing. Don't get me started. It's too early yeah, for my rant. Yeah, don't let me rant. So other, the other news is the semiconductor post you wrote on your breaking analysis was really strong. I think that also plays into what I believe to be uh, part of the AI madness is the role NVIDIA is playing. You got Google, Microsoft, Amazon, NVIDIA, all players big time in in what's happening with with AI. It's just going to be it's going to be pretty pretty amazing. And this the, and this point counterpoints. I mean, the debate is strong. I mean, even in the open source community, they're like, oh, it enhances automation, improves security. It enhances observability and monitoring. And it scales, intelligence scales, streamlining application development. That's the pro side. Yeah. The negative who, side is more complexity. <laughs> and who put out the study that said it's going to cost 300 million jobs worldwide, um, which, again, you can't protect the, the past from the future. You know, yeah. he, 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 humans have always been replaced you know, by machines, but in this first time that's cognitive, but, but, you know, that post last week with Ivana Delevska uh, from Spear Insights, you know, she came on the show and we were talking about how semiconductors usually lead a rebound in markets and semiconductors have rallied, but, but broader enterprise tech hasn't. And then you hear Samsung today in the news, uh, a steep fall in first quarter profit, 
dropping the level of steam because extended extended slump in the tech sector hit, hitting its memory chips business. So it's still really really hard to predict. But the but the other piece of that research was that you're starting to see companies, and I've been talking to them, Snowflake, Cloudflare, Confluent, Hashi, Mongo. Their growth rates are coming down, and they're starting to come in line with the 20% hyperscale growth. And these are companies that are you know billion, two billion dollars versus you know 60, mm -hmm. 70, 80 billion dollar hyperscale companies. That doesn't make sense. These smaller companies should be growing faster than the broader cloud business. And so there's either a lot of sandbagging going on there, or something's you know fundamentally wrong. And and I don't think necessarily something's fundamentally wrong. I think their model is right. Mm -hmm. Just um. It's just I I think there's some conservatism in the numbers, you know, but it's really hard to predict when it's going to come back, how it's going to come back. I think it'll come back in particular sectors. You know, I think energy, oil and gas will come back maybe sooner than you know, and transportation is is cranking, but you know, tech sector is down, and so it's you know on balance. And I think the consumer could with with unemployment being so low could actually get us out of this mess. So it's just really, really hard to predict right now. And I don't trust anything that the government predicts. Yeah, I mean, it's a hard market to predict. I mean, I just, I can tell you out here in Silicon Valley, it's it's pretty bad. Um, and again, it's the tale of two sides of the street. Are you on the sucky side, which is no funding, pivot central, do you have enough runway, or are you on the growth side? And it literally is almost becoming obvious which side of the street the winner is going to be on. And uh, it's clear to me, at least from my vantage point, I might be wrong, usually not, but I think I'm right on this one. You have a shift, just like when cloud came out. Remember when we first started talking to Andy Jassy around 2013, um, when we, before we wrote that trillion dollar baby, we we're like, trillion dollar Tam, are you kidding me? We we're like, yo, definitely it's going to happen. And it did. At that time, cloud was considered like the junkyard dog kind of way to do things. Do it yourself, roll your own. But every single startup was on Amazon. If you were a startup in that era, you were on AWS, period. You didn't do your own. Unless you had a specialized thing where you needed a box uh, in your in your, um, in your your office or your garage. You bought a super micro box, whatever. If you didn't need that, you were in the cloud. Then everyone jumped in the cloud. That exact same dynamic is happening now at much larger scale with AI, AI related coding or mindset systems, thinking, um, abstraction layers, data, data layers, things we've been talking about, data mesh, those kinds of moves are pretty obvious. So the due diligence on that is simply looking at fashion. Are you fashionable with AI? Meaning, do you look, are you actually doing the things that matter or are you stuck in the old ways? Even AI ops? A year, six months ago and two years ago was different. So you can say AI ops, old school or new school. So I think you have the two sides of the streets emerging and it's pretty obvious there will be a massive tsunami of companies, in my opinion, pivoting quickly. So if you're, sure. if you're going to see startups right now having board meetings going, okay, our runway is X. We got two years of cash. Look around the company. We're not AI enabled. We better refactor now. So those companies are going to pivot. So a percentage of them won't make it. So John, so go back to the dot com. Dot com was there was a bunch of bullshit in the dot com. It just mm -hmm. vaporized when it when it all blew up. Okay, then take a look at cloud. So post, you know, two thousand, you know, post nine eleven, really, market slowly comes back. Now. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, Google does the IPO, okay? And it was still not like super vibrant. Then you have, you know, the cloud gets announced. It's like tire kickers and, you know, experimentation. And then the financial crisis hits. And then you had a lot of CFOs saying, all right, hey, we got this cloud thing. Let's shift CapEx to OpEx. And that was when the cloud, you know, really got a foothold. 2009, 2010, and then we started just seeing innovation on top of that. And then you had cloud, mobile, social, and big data all sort of converging. We used to talk mm -hmm. about that all the time in the cube. I do worry that a lot of this AI washing does feel a little bit like, I mean, look at what Databricks did, mm -hmm. you know, with, with its, you know, generative AI, people are like, that's a bunch of crap. You know, they just threw it out there. <laughs> but so, um, but, so I worry about that, that there's a lot of, a lot of crap that's going to, going to hit a lot of funding. And then they're going to like, you know, swap spit 
and and this the whole thing's going to crash um then there's going to be a lot of low quality uh so i i do yeah. worry about that and yeah. and i think you know that then then and then everything you know once it settles I, the, I the winners I yeah I, I well sure first of all i think that similar dynamics in play dot com bubble is going to vibe is here here's the difference at that time you look at the dates from 1995 to 2001 the web, internet web hits but really from 97 98 time frame it kicks into high gear the browsers get out there ie3 launches which was the monopoly netscape gets taken out it all happened so then within the two three year period all that bubble happened and then popped there was no predecessor technology that was in play from a software development standpoint. It was old school software development. You had to get servers. The entrepreneurial agility was not there. Today, if you look at the companies that are in motion now that are on the wrong side of the street, they could pivot faster. They got cloud, they have engineering, they got open source. It's a lot easier for a clever, smart, enterprising, shrewd entrepreneur to save their company if you're a founder than, to, than it was in that decade. So to, to me, it's going to come down to the right moves. Can you actually pivot into the jet stream, if you will, of the of the on the on the other side of, this, of, the, of the world? So that to me is going to be the difference. And that is the that is the difference. If you if you're if you're sitting there, I'm I'm, look, I'm checking out Substack. They did twelve mil. They had to release their numbers because of this crowdfunding sources. Right. We mentioned them earlier with with they did in 2021. They don't put their 22 numbers up, but in 2021 they had 12 million in revenue. And 22 million net loss, and they had 55 million in cash in the bank. That's the kind of makeup you see some of these companies that have overraised. So you got a company, let's say it's not Substack, say it's a you know a company in the valley or where, and they got they raised 50 something zillion dollars, whatever. They got like 30 to 50 million cash on hand. That's a lot of cash. So that company with the tooling today can pivot faster to the new model. If they if they make the right moves, so that was hard to do back in the days, Dave. What was your? There was no real internet industry prior to the web. Yeah, hey, you you're right. Many, you had many computers, but like structurally, it wasn't like it was you, different. You're, you're making a good point. I remember uh, Peter Bell's company, Storage Networks. Um, it essentially was the cloud, uh, except it was a cloud with <laughs> it had like it was like storage cloud. It had. EMC storage and compact storage and <laughs> HP storage. It was just, it was just the data center. Storage. It was a data center with a big pipe, you yeah. know, with a big fiber pipe that was just, it had, the economics were horrible. So yeah. you're, you're, you're actually making a good point there. We've got way more agile and low cost infrastructure for experimentation. Um, so yeah. I mean, Loud, fit. Insuk Ray, who was the one of the uh, CTOs of Cal, um, co-founders of Loud Cloud with Bark and Dreesen and Ben Horowitz, Insuk Ray is a partner at uh, in um, Vertex Ventures. He doesn't get a lot of love because Ben Horowitz and Mark Andreessen get the big name headlines, but Insuk Ray is a total player, great VC by the way, Vertex Ventures. He told me about their cloud because they were the one of the first clouds. It was a data center. They had tons of equipment. It was CapEx was off the charts. Remember, you you remember, know, like, remember, <laughs> Insect, remember Insect Ray called me out at SuperCloud One. He's like, "Yeah, oh, you lost me at Oracle." <laughs> <laughs> he's such a great, he's such a great techie founder um, uh, person. So anyone who's a hardcore techie, uh, Vertex Ventures is a good plug to go to. But yeah, Dave, I mean, I, I just think that you're going to see a lot of failure. And and I've said this before in this pod, and I've been saying it on Twitter. In nuclear winter, you have a lot of failure that becomes the fertilizer for the next big thing. And I and and I've been talking to three um, good investors this week here in the valley. All said the same thing, basically saying, in the next months and in twelve to eighteen months, unicorns will be born. New unicorns are going to be born. So, was I think there's a Netflix show coming out called Unicorn Hunters. But right now we're we're there. I mean, it's happening in our world, enterprise cloud, AI, data, our space that we've been covering for 13 years with SiliconANGLE and the Cube, it's happening on our doorstep. So this, this collision of in innovations here, and there'll be winners and losers. So I think it's going to be a fun time to report on all this and, and watch and participate. And again, like I said, we have our own tech team and our own data. So you know, we have a, you know, the linguistics and language of, what, 30,000 interviews, 10 years, 13 years of Cube data. Uh, to, to play with. So, you know, I'm very bullish on AI, but again, this is classic 
cautionary tale of you got to know when to hit the straight and narrow, put the pedal to the metal and when to slow down. There's ethical issues. You got um, real reliability issues on some of the AI output. So there's going to be areas where you got to watch it, but stopping it that we talked about last week, I'm against that. I mean, yeah. Uh, before we go there, I mean, there is, there was a lot of capital deployed during the, you know, the, the pandemic to, you know, companies selling to the tech sector that were doing really well, you know, the, the fundamental assumption around hybrid work and remote work and, you know, the whole unemployment thing, uh, not unemployment, but, but hard to hire. Right. And, and that started to change. So this, I think those companies, you know, are going to be really tested, but uh, yeah, TikTok. Um <laughs> Well, let's take a break and we get, before we go to the next segment, let's take a break and um, get this RSA ad in there. I want to plug RSA. Uh, we're a media sponsor. We're going to do a little commercial for them. Um, also plug in KubeCon, Cloud NativeCon, CNCF, part of the Linux Foundation. We'll be at KubeCon. So let's let's take a break here and uh, listen to this ad, and then we'll come right back. Hello, Ron. From April 24th to April 27th, the global cybersecurity community will gather at RSA Conference 2023. On the agenda is arming you with the best practices and state-of-the-art solutions to keep your organization secure and safe. Experience the countless opportunities to make valuable connections that can open up new doors. Access cybersecurity's biggest innovations and cutting edge ideas during the four days of sessions, keynotes, skill building experiences, and more. Don't miss the chance to be stronger together. Visit rsaconference.com slash thecube23 to learn more and register and tell them John and Dave sent you. rsaconference.com slash thecube23. Okay, we're back. Dave, um, TikTok. Uh, is that a rant or is this a segment? Um, <laughs> could, be, could be both. We could go a whole show on TikTok. I, I you know... Um, I don't know if Dave Michella, who's my former boss at IDC, he was listening to the Cube Pod last week and he sent me, he said, I don't know if you and John, I think I shared it with you, um, saw my articles on this. And he wrote an article called The TikTok Debate Should Start with Reciprocity. Everything else is uh, secondary. And he said, you know, he was listening to the the Energy and Commerce Committee on TikTok. I kept waiting for somebody to ask the most important uh, basic question. Why should the United States allow China to have open access to America's vast social media market when the U.S. firms can't do the same with China? So he's calling for, for yeah. reciprocity. And I, I think he's right. He's like, we're trying to make the argument based on security grounds, which is complicated. Why not just make it on economic grounds? I mean, hello. Yeah, that's what we would say. We were saying that. Did yeah. we say that? We did. We said that. Well, what we said was that 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 China, that U.S. should force China to bite dance to sell to a U.S. based company. What Michelle did, he was pretty thoughtful. He said, "Look, just just tell China, hey, you got two choices: either we ban it, or bite dance has to sell to you know U.S. based company." And he said they're not likely going to going to choose the first one, even though they say, you know, they don't want to do the latter. And so, but even if they balk. Then now you're you're arguing fairness, and that looks that makes China look stupid, right? If you say hey, we 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 told them same rules, they walked away. So I think that's the right move, and nobody went there, right? They just went to does it work on Wi-Fi? <laughs> it's yeah. Like, well, I think I mean, like I said, that I think the those that's a it's a a show they're putting on for the cameras. And you actually, you pointed that out more specifically than I did. And I just think that the elephant in the room is that exactly what he was saying. It's like, it, there's both responsibility and also the fact that there is a security, which is also legit. You got a national security problem. You have a cultural problem, but ultimately I, I agree. I completely agree with him, by the way, that, you know, you open up your market to ours, we'll open up yours. Same. Yeah. Treat, I mean, sym symmetry is a beautiful thing. Be symmetrical. He said, he wrote the big mistake, both, the Trump and Biden administrations have made is to call for banning TikTok on national security grounds instead of economic ones. And now you're saying they could do it, but both, but he said the Biden administration should announce that TikTok won't be allowed to operate in the United States unless and until American social media firms can operate in similar ways in China. And of course, China's not going to, you know, they're going to object to that, but now you're putting it back on China and they look like fools yeah. instead of us, you know, asking dumb questions in Congress. Well, we've been all over the TikTok conversation. Um, it is big numbers. 
In fact, your daughter had a TikTok presence just moved to YouTube. It's got 10 million views. Tell, tell Dude, that story real quick. So Alicia has you know, quite a TikTok presence and she, no, nothing on YouTube. 30 days ago, she started moving one video at a time. And by, by the way, she had to use YouTube's uh, song library. Couldn't use, you know, because copyrights. So it took a little while, but so one a day. Within 30 days, she has 10 million uh, views and she's now authorized to to monetize so that's <laughs> awesome her. 10, 10. 30 days Cha ching <laughs> influencer yeah what's her secret you think besides she's beautiful and articulate she she's um she's a micro influencer you know i mean she's got her niche which is which is fashion not only fashion it's like 60s and 70s fashion right so she's like born <laughs> she should have been born 50 years earlier but um, she's a sort of throwback. And she's got yeah. this unbelievable wardrobe of, of 60s and 70s outfits. And she loves, you know, music from that era and actresses from that era and fashion from that era. And she's done a lot of work. And that was her sort of degree, um, her master's in sort of the societal influence of, yeah. of fashion. That's a great, that's a great that she can pivot off that um, hobby. And she was doing it for school. That's how she got into it, wasn't it? Like doing it for school and then kind of got into it or? Yeah, well, so she's got her master's in art history. Um, and and so she just has a passion for it and she loves TikTok and loves Instagram. And so she just started making videos. So hey, now, why don't we why aren't we micro influencers in fashion? Well, we are kind of micro influencers <laughs> in tech, right? I mean, you know, and, and, you're gonna we're gonna you do know. parody sing alongs now on TikTok. I don't know. Okay. My, off, my singing voice. Hey, hey, get so. off my cloud. It's a little rolling stones. <laughs> I think I smoked, <laughs> smoked, smoked too much weed. To, my voice got shot. I don't know. Back in the day. <laughs> get off my cloud is a favorite uh, Stone song. We should definitely do a parody on that. All right. Well, let's get into let's let's talk more about um, rants now. Let's let's what's your what's your rant for the week? Well, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but the but Lena Khan is at it again. Right. I don't know if you saw this. Um, Illumina. Right. They she shut down. It's not she, I say she she shut down the acquisition of Grail doing gene sequencing. And again, it was based on the notion that this could hurt competition. So I just don't have any confidence in the government's ability to predict anything, whether it's, you know, transitory inflation or economic uncertainty or or, or how soon a war is going to end. And, and I don't have any faith that the FTC can predict whether or not this is going to hurt competition. And so, you know, they're basically, they're killing not only big tech, they're going after big companies, they're going after all big mergers. It's just like instant negative reaction. And I, I just don't think that's right. This negative attitude mm -hmm. toward business. And it's, I think it's, 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 I think we need to have a better private public partnership in this country. And I, I just cannot stand the rhetoric around whether it's at big tech or at successful businesses it's just to me it's wrong it's just un-american yeah. yeah and then and you know also the uh, amazon was getting hammered in the U eu um story that came out this week did you see that too that's again sp yeah speaks to this kind of capex and fitzy was talking about charles fitzgerald our our our, our guy our guy our friend uh, we call him fitzy he was talking about the capex like how would they want to regulate amazon after they spent Microsoft, Microsoft and Amazon spent billions of dollars on CapEx. Like, and why can't they take advantage of some really interesting angle on that story? Um, you know which one I'm talking about, right? I do. And it's like when people say, well, hey, you know, the government supplies all this infrastructure and all these companies are benefiting from this infrastructure. Well, you know, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple are building out, they build out all this infrastructure. And again, I've said a million times, if they're breaking the law, they should be punished. But this idea that, well, that acquisition might hurt competition, which I think the, the government just doesn't really understand. I've said that the government's actions have had less of an effect than market forces. Market forces will always, you know, rule. Um, let the market <laughs> play out. Um, yeah. I, I just, uh, it's just, it's killing me. I, I, I'm watching this, 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 this trend toward the government trying to be puppet master and they're just not good at it.
Yeah. And I, I mean, it's, it was happened out of the UK, so we'll see. I mean, it's a little bit European thing. I'll be out there in a week and a half to get some, get some reporting out there and KubeCon. We'll see. I just think that you can't say that, Oh, they're going to harm competition. Well, they spent billions on CapEx and they have a good strategy and a good product. Oh, by the way, you can build on top of it too and build your own cloud, super cloud. So, so and super app. So, uh, a lot of people are not understanding the nuance of this next generation. Again, I think this is why these have these two sides of the streets. If you're going to buck the trend, like the Europeans are doing here, that's just on the wrong side of history. That's like saying, you know, back when we were breaking into the business, Dave, the mainframes, don't let them go away. Come on, everyone knows they're, they're a dinosaur. So it's going to be interesting to see who holds on to the old and who stays and gets on the new the new wave and that's going to be key now my rant this week is a little bit different right it's like i don't know if i want to rant more about how the social media is becoming polluted more and more um or the fact that the murder in san francisco is just hits the entrepreneurial bullseye because remember in the past 15 years there's been a big movement to san francisco not silicon valley Palo Alto, San Francisco, San Jose, Cupertino, Sunnyvale, you know, the Silicon Valley. And so San Francisco saw a huge uptake of tech firms. And now it's disaster. So we've always had a problem in San Francisco, and it's always been on the news, homeless, all the social issues. But now, now people are leaving, going to Miami. This is my rant. San Francisco has to get their shit together because they just got to, the lawlessness has got to stop. You cannot have it people unprotected just walking down the street or people doing cr crack and meth in the doorstep of the grandma's house or your home. And then if you don't like it, they get beaten up with a lead pipe because they know the cops are going to do anything. So that, that to me is a huge rant. I just don't think that's safe. Um, Selling the, the, outside their grandma's house, you know, Bre you know Brendan, our, our producer, is talking about, you know, it's not just doing it, sleeping there, sleeping in cars, it's like stealing shit. You can't even park a car there. So, again, this is just, again, nobody, not, you can't find one person that will take a pro San Francisco stance on crime. It is bad and it needs complete attention. Otherwise, those companies are going to flee. They're going to move to another state. And then Silicon Valley will end up being the safe harbor again. So, or East Bay. Well, That's my rant. I was in, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a move out of San Francisco. It was, I was at HPE this week in Houston. You know, they moved out of Palo Alto, you know, Page Mill. I think they did a stint in San Jose and then boom, they moved out of the state. Now that was, it was a state move out. But what are the, what are the tech billionaires saying about this, John? I mean, they got, they have an influential voice. What's what's Larry Ellison saying? What's Mark Benioff saying? I mean, they've got big presence in these cities. I think Benioff is too busy trying to save his company from private equity, right? So that's one problem. He also has a big building. And as we reported last time on the pod, the, the, the vacancy rates are expected to go through the roof as leases terminate soon. So right now, everyone's sitting on a lot of subleases. When they expire... They're going to expect a 65% vacancy rate. That's going to yeah. be a blow to the, the Salesforce tower. Um, Ellison probably doesn't care. He's in, he's uh, not in the city. Um, yeah, commercial real estate. Not a, not a lot of leadership on the tech community stepping up with the bucks or even on the influence. So, um, you know, there's Jason Calcanis said, hey, vote for me for mayor. And you get Karis Fisher at one point said that she would want to be mayor. Um, but I think it's going to take an outsider, in my opinion, like a Kara Swisher, like a Jason Calcanis to, to, to be that change agent, right? So you have to get out of this whole um, liberal anti-police vibe. Like you just, I mean, you just got to have people to enforce the law period and then solve the homeless problem. Um, so I, I think Seattle's doing a good job of trying to do this. They have people, great volunteer systems, incentives. They have a big problem up there too, but you know, it's not as rampant as here. Um, well, the big the, cities are, are brutal. Right the now. homeless problem is a mental illness problem. I mean, that's a health issue. And I, I don't think, I don't think people oftentimes, I think people sometimes forget that, or maybe they don't agree with it. It co but, it's co it's exp it's cost too, David, a little bit different out here. I mean, I would not disagree with you there, but one dynamic out here is that, 
you know, we have on our street here in Palo Alto in our offices, campers everywhere now in, in, in Palo Alto. They're closing down trailer parks where people can have a reprieve, get back on their feet. But there's families. It's expensive, right? So um, you've got a young family. You can't live in San Francisco. Rent control is going away. Prices are going up for homes. It's like uh, unlivable. Um, so I think that's causing a little bit of a, a, a power dynamic besides the the drug and the mental illness issue. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like the problem has just been, gotten so much worse in the last 10 years. I feel like the homeless have all moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. And I mean, there's still homeless issues in, you know, there are, there are still issues in New York and D.C., but it used to be a lot worse. Yeah. Now, post-COVID, maybe it's it's gotten worse i i don't know but it's nothing compared to to la and and san francisco it's bad i mean we'll see i mean this is like it's like what what episode we, we, maybe it's the first one we talked about the revolution that's coming if i was in my 20s i would be probably more organizing around um who left us this mess the boomers um and the culture has changed, right? So I think the cultural shift is happening as we've been predicting for the cube for the decade and on not only technology, but applications. And this is where I think I'm more bullish on the pro side of tech. Tech can be a force of good. And you mentioned leadership. I will say that the tech companies are stepping up leadership in sustainability, uh, diversity, women in tech, underrepresented minorities, major efforts there. Still not good numbers, but like they're not, BSing anyone. They're actually going through the motions and doing doing good work and working on that. So I think the tech for good angle is going to come. That's going to be like apps, technology that actually helps helps with some of these social problems. So I, I just haven't seen um a lot good yet. But I, I mean, think that's an opportunity. Come on, tech companies, tech first of all, tech is deflationary. What what other industry do prices just constantly come down? Right. I, I, I mean, for every year prices come down on a per whatever basis. OK, great. Every tech company is all over ESG and sustainability. Every RFP has sustainability metric in there. There's every tech, every big tech company has has sustainability goals. You know, some are a little too far out, but they're starting to pull those in. I mean, you know, tech. CEOs take this really seriously. I mean, they're supportive of their workers. You know, New York, they're like, get back to work. You know, tech, you look at a company like Dell. They're like, hey, bring your best self, you know, to work. You can work remote. We support you. HPE, you know, they'll they'll pay for a woman to to have a you know a, a, a abortion or medical procedure outside that's illegal in the state. Now they do cap it. I don't know, four thousand dollars or something. But still, there's got. I, it's still, they're doing the right things. Tech is more good than bad. There's, there's yeah. no question in my mind, anyway. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, a lot of stuff going on, Dave. Got a lot of lot of lot of things to look at. Um, I guess what I'm most excited about right now is that just in the past hundred days plus days, so much has happened, like with AI. So, to me, I just continue to focus on the big big story, which is the digital revolution, the digital transformation, business transformation of cloud, as we reported prior to reInvent with the exclusive with Adam Slevsky was this next gen cloud was happening. But what's really happening on top of the cloud is super clouds happening and you're seeing massive enablement, disruptive enablement happening with AI and data. And so just what's happening on the velocity of papers being shipped. If you go look at the academic papers hitting the market right now, it's, it's amazing. It's it's new stuff that you haven't seen before. People are sharing. It's the acceleration of, of algorithms, open source, models, um, AI. That's going to change all that dynamic. And I think that's the big story going on. And like I said, it's happening. We'll see how real it becomes and how fast it becomes real. But I, I think absolutely there'll be at least six unicorns coming out of this in all categories. Infrastructure, provisioning, middleware, apps. Every vertical, you're going to see um, some new, new autom automating, game changing things. So, that to me is the big story. It's not a really a rant. The rant is get out of the way, let it happen. Let anyone, it happen. Who, anyone blocks it is blocking innovation. Now, what you want is you want to watch it <laughs> carefully with the best people, not just the greed uh, side. I mean, it. are so, we a market you know, economy? Are we a capitalist, you know, yeah. society or not? 
I mean, do, 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 do you want to stop that? I mean, it's work. It's worked. Should there be yeah. guardrails? Yes. Should there be regulation for banks? Yes. Yeah. But the question, the question that I'm that I, I'm that I'm looking into now for the next couple of weeks as this wave goes is in old waves like this where it was massive wealth creation, it was a cottage industry controlled by the VCs. Now, with AI being so um, proliferated in every vertical, every use case, it's horizontal use cases are everywhere. It's not just going to be controlled by the VCs. There'll be other capital sources driving this. So how does the wealth creation, who gets wealthy from this? Because you, now you have the global economy, you have governments looking at big tech. There's a spotlight on tech right now. So this is out in the open. What will happen next? And it won't look like the old VC formulas of the past, in my opinion. Yeah, but I, mean, I think it, it might look it, it yeah, might look I mean, different. I mean, the wealth gap's definitely an issue. I'm, I'm not saying it isn't, but I mean, you got government saying, "Well, we're going to." No, 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 no. I'm saying, I'm saying, from a from a wealth creation when things spawn out new yeah, categories, the VCs were on the inside, all from the day one, right? well, and they made this, the most money. That's the point I want to make is that there, there, um, there, I, there is a wealth gap, and I'm sort of acknowledging that, and that's not a good thing. I mean, you you got to eat out the core of the middle class, but yeah, you know, it's like the American dream. Hey, you got these these wealthy people; they worked hard. They maybe got lucky. They made it. You can make it too. I mean, that's the, that. Yeah. It's like that message goes away. That big politician saying you can't do stock buybacks. Well, it's the company's job to decide whether or not yeah. their stock is, uh, you know, worthy of a buyback. And yeah, we all know it props up the stock. Now, granted, they shouldn't be using government money to do that. And so I, I get that. But still, yeah. the the rhetoric, uh, you know, toward whether it's big tech or big business or any business and successful people, what are, the American dream. Work hard, you, you know. Take a risk. You know you're gonna you know get get rich, or you at least have a chance to do it. That's that's the American dream. And why why do you want to take that away? Yeah, and it's, I think I think you're right. The democratization of entrepreneurship is going to be great. I think it's going to be fun to watch. It's yep. be fun to be part of. And again, it's happening in our area. It's happening in our neighborhood. Enterprise, cloud, emerging tech. And, and John, you have a couple of Catholic boys on Good Friday here. I miss the stations, but you know where I live out in the middle of nowhere. I'm surrounded by liturgy, and the monks built the the stations. I'm going to go, kind of walk them. All right. Well, have a good say some good prayers. Yeah. Uh, all right, Dave. Great, great pod, and everyone watching here. Let us know we're going to do this is episode seven. We're going to have ten episodes. After ten, we're going to try to get the groove here. We'd like to get some guests in. If you have any recommendations, DM us. Hit us up. Bring in Cube alumni, bring in thought leaders. How do we want to bring in guests? That's going to be our next next innovation on this. Figure it out and uh, continue to let us know uh, what you think. Send us notes on email, on Gmail, DMs. All channels are open. It's the Cube Pod episode seven. Thanks for listening.